In 2009, I did the bicycle ride from my home in Knoxville, Tennessee, to Washington, D.C. I rode through the heart of the Appalachian coal fields. I planned my trip to go through the, the worst places, the places that I had found out through networking with people who were fighting on top of people were the hardest hit, the densest concentrations of on top of people mining. They also happened to be the places where uh, some of the fiercest fights against Mount Takamuko are going on right now. I want to read a piece of my article which weaves the story of that ride together with the story of how the agencies charged with the protection of our environment have allowed the destruction of our sacred places. On January 11, 2009, I woke up at Adam Wells' home in Wise County, Virginia. Adam's family has lived there for generations. Looking out at his window, the scene was idyllic. A narrow strip of farmland nestled between the two long ridges that formed the Guest River Valley. A dusting of snow from spruce trees and the windowsills of the log cabin where Adam's grandfather and great grandfather were both born. With a closer look, it was clear that something was wrong. Something smelled wrong. The water from Adam's tap smelled like rotten eggs, and the wash basin and tub were stained with dark streaks. A carpet of tiny black crystals was growing on the basement floor where water from the hot water heater had been leaking. Adam's pickup truck was full of the empty plastic jugs he uses to carry drinking water home for himself and his grandmother. We rode that morning from Adam's house to the headwaters of his valley, where the ridge line was missing and there was a deep gash in the earth, a highway. The scene gave me a feeling of vertigo. The horizon had been flattened lowered and the rest of the world tilted awkwardly toward the piles of orange rubble where the mountaintops had once been. When we reached the apex of the road, the scene stretched as far in either direction as we could see. The mountains were simply gone. This is the story of how we let this great injustice happen. Before I continue, I want to say that I am deeply honored to be here, and I want to thank the people who made my article possible. Harvard Environmental Law Review editors who took a risk in publishing an unconventional law review article. My wife, Rebecca, my good friends, Matt Richardson, who blogged the trip every day, and Missy Petty, who rode with me for the first half of the trip. Dean Rifkin, my professor and mentor, and all the hosts along my route who fed me and gave me warm places to sleep after long rides in very cold weather. I had no idea when I started this project how much it would mean to the people that I met along the way, and I certainly can't express how much their kindness and spirit meant to me. I can't name them all, but I have to mention Judy Bonds, who inspired so many, myself among them, never to give up, even as she fought a losing battle against cancer. And Larry Gibson, who has the fiercest resolve of anyone I have ever met. These heroes of Appalachia were fighting the injustice of mountaintop removal since before I even knew what it was. The blasting started on Cayford Mountain, where Larry Gibson calls home when I was only six years old. Judy's and Larry's voices, however strong, have for too long been drowned out by the concussions of explosions and buried under the remains of what they once would have simply called the horizon. I was humbled to play even a small part in carrying their voices to decision makers in an administration that I hoped and still do hope has the will to right this great wrong. The goal of my article is not to break new ground. There are plenty of abler scientists who are working to explain the physical connections between the desecration of the land and the health of its inhabitants. And there are plenty of abler thinkers who are working to bring new sustainable economies to a region that has known only the industries of extraction. Instead, the article is intended to follow a single, important thread of the story of how we let this happen, tried to marshal the best data from the most reliable sources, using the first-hand accounts of fulfilled residents to fill in the gaps, to tell the story of a single word, fill. Although it may be an oversimplification, it is a useful one to say that the word fill created the mess we're in. Fill is the word that separates the two halves of the Clean Water Act. That statute makes any discharge of pollutant illegal without a permit, and EPA can't issue permits where the discharge would impair the water for its so-called designated uses. No valley fill could meet this standard. But fill material is different. The Corps of Engineers can issue a permit for 
fill even if it would totally destroy a stream. So the question is whether the leftover rubble from mountaintop removal blasting is fill. And the answer is as simple as the question. Fill was never intended to, discover, to cover the disposable, disposable waste. Uh, the very purpose of the Clean Water Act is to prevent the use of our nation's waters as waste treatment systems. But when a federal court tried to enforce that simple statutory command, the agencies, the Corps and the EPA, unlawfully changed their rules to allow the continued dumping of mountaintop removal waste as fill. This rule change was a shameless gift to the barons of the tops and the coal heaps. For the miners themselves, it did nothing but give their jobs to explosives engineers and drag line operators. For the landscape, the effects were even more dramatic. Larry Gibson's cabin sits on a 50-acre plot on what used to be Capered Mountain. In all directions, the mountain has been blasted away, leaving his 50-acre column of land behind its vertical walls surrounded by rubble. They tried to buy him out, and when that failed, they tried to scare him off. They estimate that the coal beneath this property is worth about $300 million, but the land above is worth so much more. It's the place where he was born, and his people before him as far back as the 1700s. Larry's cabin has bullet holes in it, and down the hill is the tree where they hanged his dog. On the front of the cabin is a hand painted sign We are the keepers of the mountains. I rode my bike up the steep, gravel, and snow covered road to Larry's cabin on January 15, 2009. From the top of the high wall, the edge of his property, I watched dump trucks crawling across the surface of the mountains, corpse like maggots. They looked small against the backdrop of the massive strip mine. These trucks are so large that their operators have to use ladders to climb into the cabs. They can't be made any bigger because train cars can't carry bigger tires. Through the falling snow, I watched them driving back and forth from the active part of the mine. They weren't carrying coal or rubble from the previous afternoon's blasts. They loaded up the rubble, drove to the edge, and dumped it off into the valley. And they turned around and drove back for another load. They never paused, not even long enough for the snow to erase their muddy tracks. When I couldn't watch any more, I descended down the other side of the mountain and I saw where the trucks had been disgorging their loads. Enormous valley fields choked each crevice where a stream had once been, each of them about a thousand feet high. Above them on either side was flat ground where the mountaintops had once ridden another thousand feet. It is difficult to describe the scene in words. Mountains have been decapitated. Their summits turned upside down and left in the surrounding valleys. <coughs> The soft peaks and deep clefts have been replaced by flat plains intersecting at unnatural angles. Nothing grows on the flat, buried surface above, and nothing survives in the streams below. It was sobering to see the graves of the streams that once animated a place which now exists only as a memory of home. The scene was just so helplessly silent. There has been so much loss. And yet, there is so much left of saving. And so the article concludes, we may not be able to remove the valley cliffs or rebuild the mountains we have lost, but having lost them, we may yet rest to defend what remains. Wendell Berry writes, with the land, again make common cause. Diminished as it is, granted with grief, care, so late, begin again.